he, if he took it. Then the next day he's out in the woods where he was cutting the trees down just a day ago and he finds his axe. And he comes back into town and there he sees the boy walking and he noticed that he walks just like any other boy. And when he talks to him, he notices he talks just like any other boy and acts just like any other boy. <laughs> Sometimes we even believe what we tell ourselves about ourselves. That same book by Ernest Holmes, Thoughts of Things, the quote goes on. There is very little we can do about what others think about us. But we can do a whole lot about what we think about ourselves. Why we encounter enough difficulties in everyday living without going to the trouble of creating additional ones through the nature of our thought. You know what I mean? Does anybody know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I like that story about the missing X because it reminds me of this, um, what's that great word? Propensity. Isn't that a great word? To project onto other people and then believe my projections. It's one of the devices that I use to keep me, keep me in a very tight, narrow line. And I find that often that line is created out of something very well known, past experience. You know that one? And the stories I tell myself, oh, the stories I tell myself. You know, about 10 years ago, and I remember it so clearly, I was talking to a friend because he and I had had um, a mutual friend in common. And I had fallen, well, I'd become estranged from the mutual friend, and we were talking about her. And you know how it is when you tell a story and it's almost clean, but you're just showing what you really think? Do you know that? So you're, you're being all spiritual, but e e adequately showing your righteous indignation <laughs> and how it is actually all her fault, you know. And so I, I finished the story feeling quite plump with pride. And my friend says to me, that's very interesting that you should speak like that because when she speaks about you, she only has wonderful things to say. <laughs> Ugh. You know, in that moment, I feel the walls just closing in as I feel the confinement in my story. I was stuck in a prison of my own projection. I was stuck with my story, and the story wasn't even a good one. And it produced limited options. You know, I call that selective attention. Because I understand that you and I, we can listen to exactly what we want to listen to. We can pay attention to what we want to. Yep, this is my version of life. Good luck. <laughs> and then that selectivity, it affects my interaction with what I think is real. It's like being at a big noisy party and there's a lot of sound and there's conversation and there's people and there's music and there's stimuli everywhere around. And yet, even in the midst of all of that fantasticness, I can still have a conversation with somebody right close to me and understand everything she's saying and be meanfully engaged in the conversation because I have the ability to select what I want to listen to. I can tune out things I don't want to incorporate. I can. You know, in that class I mentioned that we started with, the creative genius class that we used to teach, there was this great exercise in it that goes like this. Take a look around you, the text says, where you are sitting and find four things that have red in them. I mean, go around and go ahead and do that right now. Four things that have red in. The point of it, this exercise says, with a red mindset, you'll find that red jumps right out at you. It could be a telephone book, a notebook, piece of clothing, the blister on your finger. I don't know what it is. Similarly, the exercise says, whenever you learn a new word, you hear it eight times in the next three days. In a like fashion, you've probably noticed that after you get a new car, you see that make everywhere. That's because, the author says, people find what they're looking for. If you're looking for beauty, you'll find beauty. If you're looking for red, you'll find red. If you're looking for conspiracies, you'll find conspiracies. It's all a matter of setting your mental channel. 
No, there's another key teaching at the center for spiritual living. The value of understanding where your mental channel is set and questioning if it has to stay there. I mean, sometimes it's not really obvious, like you get up one day and say, well, you know, I think I'll go out and look for misery today. You know, it's more subtle. It's more like, you know, I got up in the morning and I got into the car of life and the radio was already tuned to that channel. And so I just started listening again. Now I know that I tuned into this channel yesterday as the day progressed and I forgot I left it there, right there. And and sometimes when I get into the car of life, I forget to change the tuning. And you know, have you heard talk radio? It's the same as it has been for the last hundred years. You only need to listen to the first five minutes and you've got it. You know it all. And then I just start listening and I get right into the stories on that channel on the radio. And then very soon I start to believe this. This is the way of things. This is the way of things. And I know it influences my decisions and my life and my interpretation and my fullness. I know it. I know that if I'm using yesterday's framework, that that doesn't give me new options, new colors, new freedom. I know it. And I've heard, I've heard it said to have a larger experience of life, I've got to have a larger idea. I've heard that. An elementary school teacher tells the story of first graders who who were given an assignment, a sheet of paper with very specific instructions. And it says, on this sheet of paper is a house, trees, flowers, clouds, sky. Color them with appropriate colors. One of the children goes ahead very busily and intently culling the whole thing and is surprised to receive the piece of paper back with the words, this is incorrect. And the teacher explains to the child that grass is green, not gray. Sky is blue, not yellow. With the question, why didn't you use the normal colors? (laughs) To which the little girl replies, well, that's because how it looks to me when I get up early in the morning and the sun is rising. Whoa, that story helped me to remember, to be open to a different idea, to other colors, to go beyond normal, to be willing to investigate everything in my life, to be less quick to assume something about what is going on in my life. I mean, do I really know? Am I sure? Am I sure things cannot change? Am I sure that this thing cannot be for good? Am I certain things cannot be different? Am I certain that it cannot mean anything beyond what everybody else says it means? Am I sure? Maybe I'm stuck seeing the landscape of my life from a midday or a midnight point of view, and maybe there's another shade. Maybe I could try see things from a different perspective. Maybe I could try see things as they really are. How about that? You know, sometimes when I go and see my practitioner or my therapist or my prayer partner, you know, one of them will say eventually something like, try to see this from a different way. Oh, it's so annoying. (laughs) You know, because I am so attached to my opinion, I've put a lot of work into it. I've spent many years building this alibi. Another way? And so I've had to train myself to be willing to do exactly that, to at least be willing to say, okay, there's got to be another way to think about this. Okay, there, there must be another way to experience. Okay, there must be another meaning to this. Especially when I feel stuck, or especially when I feel irritated, or angered, or frustrated.